Thank you. To do a very short, oh. slightly embarrassing uh, okay. introduction of David Weinberg. <laughs> but I suspect there are a lot of David groupies around, so I don't think I have to do much in this respect. Um, uh, David Weinberg is going to talk about what information was a um, extension, I suspect, of lots of things he's been working on um, over a long and thoughtful career, spanning things uh, as diverse as being a philosophy professor, being a co-teacher with me at the Harvard Law School um, in law, um, <laughs> despite he's only masquerading as a lawyer when he does it. He's really <laughs> fabulous at it. Um, uh, but to me, where David's work is most important at the moment is the reconceptualization of information and how we relate to it. Um, I can speak for my library colleagues. I know that um, when he came and spoke to us last year, um, he gave us a provocation based on everything is miscellaneous and this project that has um, hung with us since that time. Um, and so I am always eager to know the next chapter in what David is going to um, write about and present. And um, what I love about it is it's always um, something that makes me think and think and think for um, a long time after I read it or hear it. So I'm much looking forward to the latest installment of Provocation. <laughs> David Weinberger. Uh, uh, thank you, John. Uh, and I, that wasn't all that embarrassing. I could have done much <laughs> worse. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, um, thank you. So uh, unfortunately, I, I mean, I appreciate very much the introduction and um, saying that you look forward to hearing the next thing I'm going to write. Unfortunately, I sort of look forward to that too, and I'm not sure what it is. So <laughs> this is a marker along that way, maybe, and it's way out of my comfort zone. Am I talking loudly enough, by the way? Because yeah. I hope not to stand. Not quite? I'll talk a little louder then. <laughs> OK. Um, so th this is, I am way out of my comfort zone. I've been interested for the past couple of years in a question that I'm going to sort of address, but not in a packaged way, um, unfortunately. Um, the question is, how did we become the information age? And the hypothesis is, which I think is a fairly safe one in this group, which is uh, that we're coming out of the information age. We're into a new age and don't know what to call it. Um, at the moment, don't much care, but we're coming out of one age. And that's a very good time to look back at the previous paradigm, if I may use the term almost technically correctly. Um, so when you do that, what, what, is, what was information? And in particular, um, how did it affect how we looked at the world? So there's a huge amount written about the cultural history of information. And some of it is just extraordinarily good and deep and grounded in history and grounded in thought. And there's tons and tons of wonderful stuff. Um, I'm going to pick on five different um, reasons to think that um, why information became the dominant metaphor. Because that's really the, the central question. Why did it become? And so um, I'm going to look at just sort of five uh, different ways that that occurred. And I'm going to talk too much for the Berkman ethos. But I'm also going to try to go really, really quickly. So part one of this is simply to establish what is probably doesn't need establishing, which is this has been a cradle-to-grave metaphor for us, information. Absolutely and literally cradle-to-grave. I'm going to give you a quick example of the cradle and of the grave. The cradle is, if I were to stand up in front of you, which I will for a moment, and say, DNA is not information, you would probably think I am anti-science and an idiot and, you know, how can you, it would hit some of your buttons. But of course, because when we think about DNA, we think of it as coming labeled. You know, it's got pairs of stuff that look like information. And of course, let me be very, very clear, information uh, theory is a fantastic and crucial way of understanding this. I'm not saying nothing I'm going to say today do I mean to imply information and information theory isn't useful. It remains the foundation. Just as after the Stone Age ended, we still continue to use stone in the same way. We're going to count on there being information and gigantic machines that process it extremely efficiently and redundantly and securely and all the rest of that. So we look at DNA, we see information. Um, and we draw very nice pictures of it. But in fact, this is DNA. DNA is a squiggly little molecule, a little twisted uh, shoelace of a molecule. It's a physical thing. And so yeah, it's very helpful to consider it as, as, as information and to analyze it that way. But it's not information. It's a, it's a molecule. Um, so that's Cradle. Uh, here's quickly on Grave. Ray Kurzweil, who <laughs> has done just wonderful things in his life, very important thinker reading machine for the blind and dyslexic. Nevertheless, his book, The um, Age of Spiritual Machines, from about 10 years ago, asks a question. Uh, it asks, when will we 
have machines that are large enough, computers that are large enough to uh, enable us to model the 100 billion neurons of the brain and run the programs that run the brain. And at that point, Ray Kurzweil can pour his brain into the computer and survive his own death, which is really ultimately what this is about. All right, Ray will live on absolutely forever. So long as there are backups, there's going to be a Ray Kurzweil. Um, the very fact that we are willing to consider that the machine, that th this proposition even makes sense to us, that a computer running a model of a brain is a person, is Ray Kurzweil, is perpetual life, is just the fact that this even makes sense to us indicates some type of the, the depth of our commitment to seeing ourselves as information. Um, this is not just in the sciences, it's, it's in philosophy, which traditionally has a number of terms that we've used for when talking about how we know or epistemology. And we, you know, there's a bunch of different ones, but these are the standard ones in the Western tradition. And in the 20th century, we, had, we added sense data, which is a paring down of, uh, it's a, sort of a step up of in, ab in abstraction of um, sensation. And since the 1950s, we have now routinely added information. We think about uh, the brain and the mind, uh, maybe more specific, the mind as something that uh, deals with information. And there's lots and lots written that just casually uses the word information as if it were a basic constituent of the human mind. This is a very new thing. So even our own conception of what it means to, to think is now uh, based upon this metaphor of this paradigm of information. Um, lots of people, this is uh, Stephen Wolfram, um, think that, in fact, the universe itself is made of information. And there are quantum information science people. Uh, this is his cellular automata number 110, which is a universal computer. Um, there are people who do quantum information theory who, uh, far over my head, um, who will tell you that, in fact, it's a basic the basic constituent of the universe, information itself. And I, I can't evaluate that. I, I don't, I'm not a quantum you know, physicist. Um, so, the surprising thing is that even though everything in our culture just about we have reconsidered as consisting of information, sometimes very usefully, nevertheless, if we were to go around the room and do what we just did in introducing ourselves and try to answer the question, what is information, with the exception of the occasional computer scientist who I will not call on, we would not be able to answer the question. I'm quite confident that we would come up with many different ideas they would be inconsistent, and we'd be nodding at the inconsistent one, saying, yes, that's right, too. We do not know what information is. I don't, I, we don't know what it is. We talk about it all the time, don't know. So this is really puzzling. Uh, Ronald Day, in a very interesting book, mentions that he has something like 200 different definitions of information. It's really interesting that the dominant paradigm of our, up until now talks about this thing that is a constituent of the mind, of the universe, of everything, and we don't know what it is. We cannot define it, except for those of us who know the, 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 uh, the technical definition, which is precisely the one that we don't mean when we talk about information uh, in all the different ways I've just mentioned. So it's a discontinuous, information's history is discontinuous. It, it's a new thing. And so a part of the talk I'm not going to give would be an argument that the normal canonical history of information that goes from the jacquard loom that used punch cards in 1801 to do patterns and weaving up through Babbage, um, that's his machine, up through Hollerith with the punch cards and IBM, to Turing, to Shannon, to, that that history is essentially entirely false. Well, entirely too strong, but that it's an overstatement. It's reading back into the 19th century a concept and a thing that we didn't have. So it, rather than making that argument, I'm going to use Babbage, who many claim was an early information design, the first information processor, the first computer, starting around 1820, um, and just try to get from him the two ordinary uses of the term information that were pre-information theory. Information theory, which you're dating from uh, 1948 and Claude Shannon. So before that, and even after that, we mean two things by information. And you can find both of these in. Uh, Babbage's memoirs, which is a very entertaining memoir. He's a very crusty guy. So there are he uses the term information 28 times. Google Books, you can search the book 28 times. And the first time he's talking about. All the pages, or is that one of the ones that only. No, it's all the pages because it's, you know, it's public domain. So, yeah. Um, first time he's talking about uh, his attempt to raise the devil as a child to disprove some. Uh, actually, anyway, 
It's an interesting story, I won't tell you. Um, and so he had to get, ask his other schoolmates, how do you raise the devil? And so he gathered some information. And there's a very ordinary use of the term that continues in which information is simply something that you didn't know and now you do, it's like news. Second use of information, second sort of use in Babbage is also the second standard use that we have in ordinary English, which is he was asked by the, uh, one of the railways to do some tests to determine the optimal width of tracks to, so that cars wouldn't tip over on curves. And so he set up uh, a device, lots and lots of paper, uh, ink, and he generated tables of data. And the stuff that's in tables, that's information too. That's the old sense, it's also a continuing sense. And then this guy came along in 1948, this is Claude Shannon, um, who took over the term. He invented a new definition for it. It was not, what he was calling information was not called information generally before him. There, there's a technical, but let's, basically that's right. He took that term, he invested it with a new meaning along with a bunch of other terms, such as noise, um, and he gave it a highly technical meaning. Uh, the technical meaning is, so he, he was at Bell Labs, he was trying to figure out, uh, very important for Bell Labs, how do you, how much, what's the capacity of a particular wire for telegraph or telegram or any other medium, because he abstracted it above any medium. So what's the capacity for carrying what we now call information? Uh, and he worked out a formula, which I would tell you about, except I can't, uh, people here could, but I can't, um, which is a mathematical expression of this, um, which this is from, the first lines of, uh, of, of, his, of chapter one. Um, it's a teletype and telegraphy um, transmit information. So information seems to be something that moves through, it gets transmitted, um, and it's generally a discrete channel in a system whereby a sequence of choices from a finite set of elementary symbols can be transmitted from one point to another. So you're transmitting this set of chosen symbols out of some range of known symbols. There's a huge mathematics behind it. It's very difficult mathematics. It's not what anybody generally here means by information. It's not what the culture took up from this. So the history that, excuse me, I over gestured. The history that uh, starts with two simple definitions of information and then moves to information becoming the stuff of the universe and the stuff of the mind uh, is actually quite dis discontinuous. There's a breaking point, the insertion of a new meaning of information. Uh, before, before Shannon, the stuff that Shannon was talking about as information was called by his colleagues intelligence, by the way. So why did this happen? Uh, what enabled information to take over the world? And I, I want to be very careful here. A lot of the most interesting and important stuff that you'll read about this is about the, the deep utility of information. If you're using a hard drive, you, you know, uh, the, the science of hard drives for transferring information reliably into your computer is all based on information theory. So it's hugely useful. It lets us conquer a whole bunch of the world, which brings us to the second important point I'm not going to talk about, which is the politics of information. There's wonderful stuff written about this, about information as mastery, as uh, information as a product of the war machine and information uh, in, in, and gender. And I'm not going to talk about any of that. Right, but it's really, really important. So um, I want to talk about five elements in light in each case in light of how it looks after the end of the information age, how it looks to us now. So um, first point is that information scales. It allows corporations to grow larger than businesses used to be able to grow. You know, we have a lot of, uh, we have machines that can manage that now. But the secret of the information age, which people at the time absolutely sensed, and you see this in, all, in much of the cultural anxiety about computers, was that information worked by reducing the amount of information. And so you stripped out everything about this person except for the 8, 10, 15, 50 categories that were decided top down uh, were going to be important. And people made good decisions about this. But it only worked as a, as a strategy because we were able to strip out so much stuff and keep only enough that our computers are able to manage. So the information age is actually all about stripping out information. And if you look at uh, an employee now, she's going to look much more like this where in the post-information age, the age of the link, it's just crammed with information, overflowing bottom-up connections outside of every box as much as we possibly can at an unheard of rate. Um, so a very, this is a, all about abundance in the new age, not about stripping out in order to uh, manage scale. Uh, it's also in real language. In fact, the, the thing that links do 
in the new age is the opposite of what information did. Information stripped out, links are all about uh, attaching to some new page, that's a page, and pulling it in and expanding the universe. I mean, that's obviously what links do. They're completely expansive, never have any doubt or worry, just pull it in and make your world bigger. And so the, we're now in an age of abundance, of course, when it comes to, you know, there's lots of scarcities, but in the, in the realm of creativity and works, we're in an age of abundance, um, which is an abundance of good stuff, but also an abundance of crap. Um, the, I don't know if it's an irony or what, but we're actually far better able to manage the crap, the abundance of crap, than we are the abundance of the good. The abundance of crap we manage through spam filters and all the rest of it. Uh, and we do a pretty good job of it, right? We're still using email, most of us, even though there's so much spam. But we manage the, the bad stuff. The good stuff is the actual challenge to our culture. Because we have institution after, after institution and conceptual framework after framework that assumes there's a scarcity of good ideas, there's a scarcity of good information, there's a scarcity of good creativity. And so if you can corner a little bit of that good stuff, you can monetize it and build an institution, whether it's newspapers or it's educational systems or it's healthcare or it's government, they're all premised on the idea that there's just not very much of it, so people will pay. And we have since learned, newspapers have learned, for example, that that's just not the case. There's just an abundance. So you take the good op-ed writers, and you put them behind a paywall at the New York Times, as they did, and some people will pay. Nevertheless, the rest of us who don't, we don't sit around saying, I have nothing to do. The time when I used to spend reading the, uh, the, the columnists I like, I now have nothing to do. No, there's so much good stuff, I'm never going to get to all of it anyway. So the institutions that depend upon scarcity start to fail. In fact, what of course that means, as others have pointed out, that the information age was about separating signal from noise. That's what got it started with Shannon. Now there's so much signal, the signal is, is noisy itself, uh, except it's not, there's so much good stuff that the overwhelming amount of signal that can look like noise is in fact an abundance of riches. The, the signal noise model doesn't work real when, well when applied at the high edges, high ends of the, of the web. Um, of course, this requires new ways of organizing. I'm not going to talk about that. <laughs> Second is information as a resource. And I'm going to try to go faster. So um, we just naturally, the way we think about information is that it's an external resource that we can delve into, we can query it, and we can just fetch results. Um, and you know that's great, that works, obviously. There's a science to that. It's certainly not easy. But the web is a place, when we talk about it, we talk about it as a place that we can enter. It's got places and sites, and we, we go in the web. So it feels a bit more, at least conceptually, like a place that we enter. The idea of entering the old sort of information, you know, the information age information, if you were to say, well, we're going to enter that, we did think about that during the information age in two ways. One is we, we did movies like Tron, where we entered the information space and we became you know, uh, our own, what do you call, avatars. You know, and it was not a pleasant experience. We wanted to bust out of it. And the other is that the other way we thought about entering the inform information space during the information age was that it was going to engulf us. It was a threat. We were going to find ourselves as Catherine Hepburn and desk set being confronted by the men with clipboards and their, their spewing realms, reams of, of, of paper. And that was also, that was hugely threatening. So the idea of entering an information space used to be just, you know, we hated the idea of it. Now we routinely think about ourselves as entering it, the information space, the, the web space. And not only that, I mean, that's just, that's, I think, just a transitional mode. The, the two now are so integrated, the web space and the real world, that we can't even bring our children out of this mixed environment because they're always in it. And the two are completely fused. It's become the world. So second point about this is that um, back in the, the old days, the information days, we used to have two terms that we would use to measure the effectiveness of a retrieval system, which were precision and recall. All right, so precision is, these two terms mean when you do a query, do you get back everything that meets the criteria, and do you get back only? Do you get false hits as well? And that was how you, you measured. Over the past 15 years in the age of the web, uh, as things scaled up beyond belief, a trillion pages, the search engines are now saying, we've had to add some new criteria for queries for doing searches, which are relevance and interestingness. Because when you get back so much, when there's such an abundance and you get back so many hits, 
the idea of worrying about did I get everything? Who cares? You know, that's page 400 million at Google. You're never going to do it anyway. So the, the idea of precision and recall um, is usually not, sometimes very important. In the law library, for example, they're hugely important. But out in the gigantic world of, of the web, they lose some significance. And instead, we have to put back into the system some criteria that are, are based upon the intersection that are not based solely on what's in the information system. Relevance has to do with whether it meets your needs, which means that your needs are now uh, an integral part of this interchange. And interestingness, which is a term from Delicious and from you know the site Delicious and from Flickr, um, also obviously are criteria that bring the idiosyncratic and the personal back into the system. The third part is the one I'm least happy with. Um, we. <clears throat> back. Oh, darn, I went back too far. <sighs> no, it's, well, thank you. <laughs> no, it's a, um, the third, why did information take over everything? Because bits, the basis of information in our modern conception of it, can apply to everything. Or they can apply to every, there's nothing that escapes being bitified. Um, Bateson, in the early days of information theory, said, a bit is a difference that makes a difference, right? It's, it's, just, it's just a difference. And so we, ha we have this idea. We're perfectly at home talking about atoms versus bits. Right? It sort of makes sense to us. We don't stand up and say, what? We say, oh, yeah, we sort of know where you're going with that. Whereas, uh, and a bit is simply a difference. That's all that it is. It measures some difference. We don't, on the other hand, feel comfortable saying, oh, atoms versus links. That doesn't make sense to us, right? We would say, what the hell are you talking about? What do you mean atoms? But atoms versus bits, we sort of think the two have some type of equivalence. Um, and that's just odd. So the reason we have this sense of equivalence is that bits apply to anything. So they can be the cat is on the mat, or the cat is off the mat, or Kurzweil is in the machine, or Kurzweil is not a machine. That's a single bit. Or it could be a plain or peanut M&Ms. Really doesn't matter. Each of those is a single difference and thus a single bit. You put all these bits together, and, and so they can apply to anything. You put them together, it means we can model just about anything. We can make a coordinated set of bits, understand their relationship, and have a model that's coextensive with the world. This is a remarkable property of bits. They apply to everything or almost everything. There are some counterexamples. We can entertain them later. But you know, basically, it applies to everything. But we can only do this because bits are really fundamentally not like atoms. A bit. You know, an atom is an atom. I sort of believe in the real world and that atoms exist. Whether I'm here or not, there are atoms and quanta and all the rest of that. And not so much for bits. That hole, those holes in that card, those are bits, but they're only bits because they're holes in a card that's being used in the system. They're, as holes, they're not bits. The holes in this are not bits. Now, you may be able to get a lot of information about the culture by considering the shoelace hole. Certainly, you could. But it's not a bit. The colon is a hole. It's a long, long hole. It is not a bit. Not all holes are bits. Bits have to be in a system, a system that's highly regularized and standardized. Um, if you just punched a hole randomly in the, in the punch card, they wouldn't be bits. They would be noise at best. Second reason bits are not like atoms is here's a dust cloud. It's way off. I don't know where. You know, but it's, it's way off where, and there are actually 100 billion. I'm, I get to make up my example, right? So there are 100 billion motes of dust, and they're all spinning counterclockwise. I'm sorry, not all. Some are spinning counter, some are spinning clockwise. Well, there are 100 billion uh, neurons in Kurzweil's brain. And some of them are on, and some of them are off. Some are you know, active, some are not. We could model that in a computer. Um, we could model the computer, the ons and offs, in dust, in, in dust spins. And so somewhere there's a cloud of 100 billion spinning motes of dust. And if we say the counterclockwise is on and clockwise is off, they exactly replicate Kurzweil's brain state during the 10 minutes when he saw his wife for the first time, his future wife, and fell in love. And so that dust cloud must be Kurzweil falling in love, according to the theory. But of course, that's absurd. It's not only absurd, it's self-contradictory. Because I could, it's my example, I could just as easily say, you know what? 
counterclockwise is a zero and clockwise is a one. And suddenly it's no longer Kurzweil falling in love. It both is and is not Kurzweil falling in love. Bits are not real. Bits are a construction. They have meaning because of the meaning that we give them. They are dependent upon human intervention and thus cannot be like atoms. Bits, uh, just one last point in case this is not clear. Uh, I think I may be overselling, but we'll see. Um, a bit, when you bitify the world, when you turn the analog, the real world, in, the continuous real world into bits, whether you're doing a map of a shore or you're measuring the voltage in a transistor to decide if it's an on or an off, uh, it's an it's a analog world, so you have to decide what your resolution is going to be. Where are you going to say one bit flips and the other doesn't? For a satellite map, it's different than if you're two feet away from the shore and mapping each grain that way. Um, and likewise for computers, there's an arbitrary decision made about what the level of voltage has to be for the transistor to be counted as on or off. And so bits are dependent upon our resolution, what, our, what resolution we're looking at. And that's dependent upon our purposes, what we're trying to do. Bits are not atoms. Bits are not, uh, atoms are not that way. Compared to the web, bits are about reducing differences to the fewest possible states, generally two, on or off. So you, you take something very complex and you build it out of an enormous number and a complexity of very simple objects, which is why they seem, one of the reasons they seem like atoms. But they simplify. The web is this web of links, and every link, uh, almost every link, comes with some language around it that says what the relationship is. Not, this, not mere difference, you don't just click and say, there's a different page here, go there. You say, no, you'll love this, you'll hate that, this amplifies, this detracts, whatever. But you explain what the link is, an indefinite number of possible sorts of relationships. The web has been, in the past 15 years, about building an enormously complex, intricate world, as opposed to the desire of the information age, which is to simplify so we can do some very useful things. The web, is, it seems to me, is mainly about this endless, endless complication. An abundance, but not just an abundance of simples, an abundance of rich, linguistic, human intentions. Fourth, we're making our way through this. We'll be done very soon. It looks like, so why did information become a dominant metaphor? There's a huge amount written about communication theory. I am not a communication theory person. I'm going to be very superficial. Um, but I want to get to a slightly different point. So Shannon, when he writes his paper in 1948, he called it a theory of communication because he's working for at and It sort of made sense. But he was not thinking about communication the way that we use it in ordinary life and the way in which information theory uh, swept through. I mean, became, information theory became a much broader theory of information. He's very specific right at the very beginning, Shannon is, to say, I am not talking about semantics. I don't care about the semantics. All right, he's doing something else. But he put, up, he put in this picture, and this picture looks to us like a picture of communication. There's somebody, well, I'll say somebody, oh, that's fine. There's somebody with a message that gets encoded into, let's say, into a signal, let's say language maybe, or all the other various forms of signaling that Judith Donath will be happy to tell you about. Um, goes through some type of channel, words beating their wings in the air, um, gets decoded and understood. It looks like a, this, is, this looks like communication. And in fact, if that wasn't enough, the guy that co-wrote, so Shannon wrote this paper, and then it got published as a book with the first chapter by Warren Weaver, who was at the Rockefeller Foundation. Weaver's, this is the thing that people remember Weaver for. When you read his, his memoirs, it's like three lines in it. That's, that's, you know. So he wrote this book, a little bit casually, perhaps, um, apparently. And right at the very beginning, this is, these are the first words of his damn book. Right? He says, the word communication will be used here in a very broad sense to include all the procedures by which one, mi one mind may affect another. This, of course, involves, and then he names them. And in case that's not enough, it says, <laughs> in some connections, it may be desirable to use a still broader definition. This is exactly the opposite opening of the piece that it introduces. It says, very narrow sense of communication. So we have this endorsement in, in the canonical book. But still, you have to ask, this is a book very few people read. It's information theory. Uh, why did we accept it? Why did this book and that vision have such a, a view of it? Why does this look like communication to us sufficiently that some guy we don't know named Warren Weaver says it? Uh, why does this look like communication? And it's because, as 
many have pointed out, including Paul Edwards in a wonderful book, The Closed World, we, we have a con conduit metaphor of communication, not from information theory before that. We have this notion that information is basically like, uh, excuse me, communication is basically like tin cans. You know, message, message, conduit in between. So then you have to, so that picture looks like our previous idea of communication, but then you have to ask, well, why do we have that idea of communication? The notion of communication as me making sounds and vibrations in the air that's reaching to Ethan, who then blogs them apparently. Uh, and there's such a weird idea of communication. I and mean, this is communication, there's two people talking. And the very thing that they don't notice or really care about, but enables it, of course, is the vibration of the air and the transfer of the message. But that's not what communication is about. It's all the other stuff. It's just the, the world in which these people exist in which they share some concern. So you have to ask, why did communication look to us like tin cans so that when information came along, information theory came along, that looked like it was explaining the tin can theory of communication, we said, ah, yes, now we got it. Now we know how communication works. And I hate to be trite, but I think it goes back to Descartes and the history that leads up to him, of course. Um, who was trying to explain, you know, trying to explain mind, body, how could the mind ever perceive something as different from it as the world, the physical world, doesn't seem possible, and still, you know, people worry about that. Um, so he solved the mind, mind body problem. Um, and I should probably say, this is not simply Descartes intervening, this is a long tradition in Western philosophy that culminates with him. He says, well, you know, obviously we get mental pictures. Something happens, we get mental images, uh, and, because, and we live in these mental images. We can't ever get to the real world, which sort of our mind reconstructs it in terms of images and sounds and the rest of it. And if that's the case, first of all, it's a very lonely view of the world, because it's you and your mental images, and that's about it. But if that's what it is, then communication, at best, if there are other people at all, which is you know, maybe doubtful in this world view, then communication has to be transferring of, a, of an image from one person to another. That metaphysics makes sense of our theory of communication. That's why communication looks to us like the movement of a message and the reconstitution of an image in the head. It is a pathological metaphysics, though. This is, strictly speaking, a schizophrenic metaphysics. Um, there's a much more natural way of talking about this, of communication, which we also, you know, it's totally obvious, you'll accept this, I'm sure, which is to say, oh, two people talking, what's happening is, you know, they have some topic, they, they share a world, they're in the world together, yeah, pretty much right, and um, there's something about the world that matters to them and that maybe they don't see the same way, so they talk and they, oh, I can animate this in case it's not clear enough. <laughs> So they're in a world, they share it, they, there's something that matters. The world is interesting and relevant to them. Two terms that have come up earlier in this talk. There's something that's interesting and relevant, and so one talks to the other, and they, this one maybe now sees the world differently than he did initially. And sure, there's messages going back and forth. That's a part of it. But those messages don't matter for anything. They're just vibrations in the air, unless the rest of the stuff is there. And to have a, a picture of communica communication that strips out everything that's interesting and important about communication, like why we do it, and the fundamentals of how it works, which is that we see the world differently by talking with one another, and we see it differently because it matters to us. To have that image, the tin can image in your head as a theory of communication is just too bad, but that's where we've been, not because of information theory. You know, Shannon, Shannon was talking about two tin cans and a string. That was absolutely his issue, and he tried to confine it to there. We leapt onto this because we already had this metaphysics in mind. So, um, you know, content goes through a medium, ends up more content with a disruption of noise. Um, in the interest of time, I'm going to skip a really interesting little bit. Um, I'll recommend the Paul Edwards book, uh, which talks about the um, wartime studies of how to improve communication on a battlefield where things are booming, like literally booming, you know, guns are going off. The way they came, the system they came up with is exactly parallel to Shannon's information theory that arose from the same milieu. And the only reason I want to make that point is that it's a theory that if you start if you're trying to understand communication and you start from the battlefield, which is the most extreme case of the inability to communicate, it is the hardest place in the world to communicate. It's like hell. It's as close as we get to hell. If that's where you start your theory of communication from, that's what you're trying to explain, then communication looks like it's a challenge 
that has to always be overcome? How, do, how the hell do we ever manage to communicate? If that's your theory, you're trying to figure out how we overcome the channel. That also gets represented in the information theory diagram that has noise in, intervening. That view of communication is based upon the failure, an example of the failure of communication. This is something that we do in our culture repeatedly. We explain things by looking at their failure as if that's especially revelatory and usually it's especially misleading. So content, medium content, now we have hyperlinks, which are just weird in this regard. First of all, you can't figure out if they're content or medium. They're, in fact, both, and the terms don't apply very well. They're certainly part of the content of a page, but they're also the medium by which you go to the next page. So the, the distinction just isn't helpful here. This one that's so obvious in the information world. Um, and second of all, these are hyperlinks are in some sense a path through an existing world. They assume communication. They assume it's just so easy to make the link that it's, you're not being interrupted by no. You're just hyperlinking. And yet they're not simply paths through an existing world. They're also generative paths. They make the world. This, web world exists because people have made hyperlinks. Every time you make a new hyperlink to a new page, you are increasing the abundance of that world. In the age of links, we assume that communication is possible, not a challenge. We assume that there are conduits, even as our conduits are creating the world that they move through. And it's, it's a model that just breaks entirely the information age uh, understanding of communication. Finally. We can build any models of anything using bits, just about. And we are all familiar with the various critiques of models, which are, you know, models are very useful, but we also know how disastrous they can be when they're misused, including a financial meltdown. Oh, God. Saved, saved. It's footnoted. It is footnoted. Come back. We will hyperlink it. I'm, th I'm, I'm almost done. I'm really desperate. Just, uh, you know. Get up, go, go, go. <laughs> go, go. Okay, go, go. I'm ready for this. So um, we're all familiar. Thank you. We're all familiar with the uh, critiques of models. Um, oh, for example, uh, the famous one of the famous examples is Yucca Flats, where uh, where atomic waste is being disposed of, and the EPA asked required that um, before they would accept it as a place for atomic waste. They had to do a model that looked out 10,000 years to make sure that it would be safe storage. And sure, that, there's some sense in that, of course, because you, some things you can predict, maybe water tables and, and flows and things like that. But there's just so much that you can't predict. Right? I, the dinosaurs didn't see that coming, and neither does Yucca Flats. And so the, we model, in the modeling, we assume there's a regularity, a predictability, um, a denial of the contingent. I'm not saying no models. I'm saying there are limitations to them. We sometimes forget those limitations. Um, and we forget another limitation of models, which is they're part of the information age. They are about excluding that which doesn't, that, excluding that which doesn't fit um, so that we can proceed and get the benefits of what does. And so they inherently deny the abundance of the world as well, the overflowing, uncapturable, where words fail us, overflowing of the world. Finally, they're purely formal, right? It doesn't matter what you model it in. If you model it in, in swirling dust or in, in, in silicon, silicon's easier to use, but a model is a model. It's a purely formal abstraction. And that seems to leave out something too, like, you know, the body. Um, it goes back to bits, you know, these really simple things. So I just want to say one thing more about them. A bit is a measurement. It's a measurement of a difference. Every other measurement that we have measures something particular, uh, you know, weight or length or uh, I don't know, blood sugar or something. Everything measures something except for bits, which merely measure pure difference. That's where they, they, that's where they get their power. They apply to everything. They don't, and thus they, okay, the, the point is, this is great. You can model the world in bits because they're so abstract. But the, one of the key facts about the world is that the world never shows itself to us merely as a difference. It always shows itself to us in particular ways. And maybe that's because we have bodies, and maybe it's a limitation, but it is how the world shows itself to us. It does not consist of mere differences. It consists of differences in things that we perceive as light and warmth and texture and all the other. No. The world always shows itself to us in particular ways. So ultimately, the power of bits, their pure formality, comes from the fact, and our ability to model the world, comes from the fact that they are exactly how the world is not. 
So we have this this model here, and we got is that animated? Um, underneath it is noise. Noise is the interruption in the inf information system. It's, it's the difficulty in the system. It's why we need information theory in the first place, because we're trying to overcome noise and increase capacity. That noise is, in fact, the, the, the qualities of bits that are missing, the contingency, the abundance, the fact that it's not merely formal, that's the world. And in this diagram, noise is, in fact, how the world shows up. The world does show up in Shannon's diagram. It shows up as an interruption, as noise, as, as the problem with the system. This system, this abundant system that's beyond systemization, um, is all about the sorts of differences that the information world tried to exclude. What looked like noise to the information age is in fact the world. And it's a world that's expressed through the differences that the web expresses with every link. Um, so you can see, if you want to, the web as the revenge of the particular and the idiosyncratic after an age of bitifying and the enormous power of, of bitifying. Um, everything on, the, on this web is interesting to at least one person because they put it there. Yeah, except for some stuff, but it, you know, it's there because it was interesting, it was relevant, and they thought it would be interesting and relevant to someone else, maybe to just a few. It is a web of noise. Literally speaking, from the information age point of view, it is a web of noise. That's where it gets its strength. And we, oddly, we, we worry both about the fact that it's too fragmented, and so we won't have a joined culture, and at the same time, we worry that we don't appreciate the differences enough that the fragments express differences, but that we stay within our shelves. And there are people who talk about this a great deal, and extremely cogently, from whom some of us have learned the best, an enormous amount. <laughs> <laughs> um, so uh, the irony uh, of this change from the web, uh, from the age of information, the age of links in the web, is that if this is the return of, of noise, if the world is now expressed as noise, it may be, if Ethan and others are right, and I think that he is, that in fact the problem is that this web is not noisy enough. We're not enough appreciative of its differences. So, thank you. I think, I mean, I think it's a part of the, what was interesting but also kind of challenging about this talk is that you keep moving from all different levels of how you think about what information is. So that if you look at a word that's in a paragraph, there's information in the fact that this word is over here and the next word is to its right. But to the speaker of English or anybody who reads left to right, we know that there's a piece of information that says in this sequence, that's the piece that comes next. Um, if you're reading Hebrew, you have a different piece of information. And if you're looking at, you know, print is now part of the language of things like and some are highly sequential, and some you look at a page, and part of the issue is where did it play with that information and what the sequence is. So I'd say that something like a link, the fact that you physically do something like click on it, and the information of what comes next should you follow this information is a in instructional bit of information about sequence, just like where a paragraph is or how you turn pages or any other kind of where you're like following, you know, if you have this symptom, click here and go to the hospital now and follow that. And I think that's separate from the fact that there's a computer instruction embedded in the HTML that makes something happen on the computer when you click. So, um, first of all, you're absolutely correct that I bounce around levels all the time, and that's um, uh, part of my slipperiness. It, does make, it, 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 it uh, introduces error. So it's good to point it out in specifically in, in specific places. In this case, um, I'm not thinking about the link in terms of the HTML underneath it. And underneath the HTML, there's you know, IP, and then there are packets, and there are bits, right? And, and databases underneath all that, um, often. Um, I'm thinking about the link as a bit of language. And m much of what I said about links absolutely it's just language. It's true of language itself, and it's because links are usually linguistic and almost always semantic, even if not linguistic, that they have the properties that I'm pointing to. And in some ways, the, 
the fundamental debate between the, the ages, I think, is actually one between information and language. So um, I'm. So, yes, but I think I'm actually thinking about it differently than you are. So, in, in, there are many semantic gestures in the world, right? um, and many things. Shoelaces carry information, um, not in the information theory sense, but they guide the. <laughs> I wasn't ironic, but it's a very hard question. There's lots of signaling going on in many, many different forms. Um, You're sending the good colleague signal to Professor Donat here? Yes, I am. And I'm seated in the you know, body of all, you know, all the people to be saying this to. It's you who have you know, studied this for a long, long time. Um, so absolutely, there's a lot of signaling going on. There's a lot of information that is non-linguistic. Um, links obviously contain, as all of language does, a lot of non-linguistic information. A word order, just you know, to take your example. Um, blue underlines for links. Nevertheless, links are usually in, in the web world, they are actual language. Not always, but usually they're, they're actual language. There's plenty of other information around them. So I, remember, I'm not, do, I'm not trying to generate an explanation of how the world works. I'm interested in the contrast of the two paradigms. And when we look at the two paradigms and think about links, very few of us think about the HTML or the packets underneath that. We think about blue underlined text that we can click on, and in which case that model, uh, the old model mm -hmm. of there's a medium, there's content and there's a medium, has doesn't we wouldn't come up with that model if we started with the link world. It doesn't fit very well in the link world because the link is both content and uh, tool and medium. David, can I try a totally different question sure. and then go to Salil? Which is, um, I'm not so sure about that last. I'm giving part, you yeah. a um, <laughs> it's a warning that the computer scientist is up yes. next. Um, oh God. Uh, so I took, for instance, Qtrain manifesto and everything you've explained, and other things you've done to be normative projects. A project where you're trying to describe a version of the world that you wish we would see, right? In Good Train, it's the marketing people and everything, miscellaneous librarians and others, right? Um, is this, I heard this as mostly a descriptive project. That's that you're trying yeah. to create a theory that spins things out of what you've seen and what other people have said. Is there also a normative component here that you're see, helping us to see? Because I missed yeah. it if it were. Oh, good. Were. So um, I don't know if you hear in the back, there's a really mm -hmm. uh, good observation, which is. Other stuff that I've written, and in general my interest in life, is normative. That I, I, I'm a polemicist in some ways, uh, which is not, you know. I, mean, I was a good planning thing. on asking JP's question as "so what," uh, which is a, a much, much more aggressive and a less generous version than the one that, that Paul before. You can answer either one. Um, so I, I choose to answer JP's. What a surprise! Uh, I'll try to address yours also. So the answer to JP's question is: uh, I actually, you know, I'm pretty sold on the on the web. I really like the web. Um, but I'm not trying to, in this case, I'm not interested in proselytizing for the web. In fact, I'm trying to stay aware of and stay away from stuff that is too, if there's proselytizing going on, and there is a little bit, it's actually for um, a particular brand of philosophical outlook, uh, not web versus um, information theory. In terms of the so what, there isn't any. Um, I, you know, I wish there were. I've tried to, uh, this is, so this is stuff that I find interesting and relevant, and I don't pretend that it's interesting and relevant to anybody else. I've tried to ask a question that I hope is leading, um, which is, inf uh, information is weird. How did we ever go from a, a, a definition that none of us know, except for you, except for the computer science people, um, how did that sweep through the culture? What did it speak to in us? Because we embraced it. At the same time that we feared it, we nevertheless embraced it and redefined ourselves. How did that happen? Um, and I don't have a comprehensive answer. I don't have a theory. I don't think I'm going to have a theory of how this happened. Um, I just find it really, really interesting. So no, so what? Sorry. I it's wish there were. It's a narrative. I wish it were more of a narrative. There's so, so many really wonderful narratives written um, about this. It, is it possible that the answer is, I, I don't know what the so what is yet? I don't think so. I don't even know what a so what would a so what look like in this case. 
So we should embrace the web. Uh, you know, that's, that's sort of a done deal. I, I, I mean, David, I, I think I think you absolutely have a somewhat, but we can, should talk well, about the since Salil's got his hand up. So you, you go and then I really like you, too. Yeah. I'd love to know what the so what's are. I'm, I can't say so. Uh, extremely stimulating for someone who is used to thinking of information mostly in the Shannon uh, sense, of, sense of the word, and particularly the transition between the two ages. One, one thing that I am still trying to get my head around is the, um, I wouldn't call them uh, criticisms, but the, the, the descriptions of, I guess, the mathematical model as being um, totally different from what people conceived of as information before, unless I misunderstood you. Um, so oh, before Shannon. Before Shannon. Yeah. That there is a sense in which Shannon's notion of information is capturing the idea of learning something you did not know yes, before. Surprise. We can right. say that's something that I did not know before, something I couldn't have predicted until, um, and, uh, you know, until receiving this um, a, a bit of inf piece of information and a quantitative measure of how much I have learned that I did not know before is you know, what is the chance that I could have predicted this before yes. before being which is is a rough sort of a rough measure of how informative we find a talk or a statement if it's the stuff we already knew then it's not information or it's barely information and Shannon is thinking about the degree of surprise in what we learn so it does map to uh, the previous understanding of uh, and current understanding of information is something we're about to learn oh, okay okay so and, and well, no, I, this is very helpful. I, I miss, you know, I, in my rush, I mischaracterize this. And there's also a connection between Shannon's use of the word information and the other prior, uh, re, you know, recent prior, because information is a medieval term, um, of information that's uh, in the table, right? Because obviously that's how we have mapped and described databases explicitly as tables of information. Right. Right. So there's a reason why he took it, the term information. His uh, quantification of it is so beyond the understanding of ordinary mortals that I think it's still a question why somebody who took this term and defined it in you know, 40 pages of equations, why that term suddenly in 10 years leapt through the culture. So. You, you're absolutely right that his redefinition of it does, there's a reason why he took the term information, there's a reason why he took the term noise and, uh, and channel and signal. Uh, all of these, you know, people have done wonderful work tracing the etymologies into Shannon of, of these terms. And they're, they're sort of good marketing terms, and entropy, which is a famous example. Uh, because he does talk about entropy and his formula maps to the physical entropy. Right. And the great story that turns out not to be true is that von Neumann said, why don't you call it entropy because then nobody will understand you. It turns out that probably is not a true story. Nevertheless, yeah. uh -huh. each of the terms does have some, it made sense. It wasn't yeah. purely. Carol had a so oh, one, okay. though. Oh, <laughs> okay. consider information because if you consider a link is everything as you were saying before uh, you probably will have problems make things work together so you make uh, and even to make links work together uh, here I'm thinking of what I call uh, what's called the principle of separation of concerns uh, or modularity which divides things into layers and help us to separate what works on what layer uh, and I bring a little what separation of concerns means uh, from uh, a paper that's called On the Role of Scientific Thought. Uh, techniques for effective ordering of one's thought that I know of. This is what I mean by focusing one's attention upon some aspect. It does not mean ignoring the other aspects. It's just doing justice to the fact that from this aspect's point of view, the other is irrelevant. It's being one, the multiple track minded simultaneously. So I'm working with this concept work on innovation theory and other stuff, but how do you apply this? Because if one thing, if links, is everything, you probably cannot make them work together if you think also of interoperability issue. So how do you make uh, So, so um, just give me an example of what you mean by an interoperability issue, because I'm not sure what you mean by working together. 
So, for example, if you think about TCP/IP, the web, content, these are layers that make the internet work. Yes. But if you say that link means everything, uh, in, as you were saying before, it's not just a piece of information, or it's not just a tool, but it's also information is also knowledge. How are you gonna hmm. program things to work in each layer? The the layers of the stack. Yeah, for example, and it's not run. that works. I mean, it doesn't matter what I say about hyperlinks. That stuff's going to keep on on working. I, I um, don't mean to say that links are everything, and everything must be reconsidered as links. Um, I'm not. In fact, that would be a big new theory, David. That would be a big new theory. Uh, uh, um, that's actually so. That question, what is everything, <laughs> is equivalent to the. I think it's I was going to get there. <laughs> um, if you were to ask that in the in the information age, the rough answer, the the par the the answer that you, what it means to say that uh, an age has a paradigm is to say, well, rough, very roughly, everything is information, and that's the extreme view of the information age. But you know, that's why it's the paradigm, um, the atomic age, which is sort of parallel, consecutive, everything is atoms. Um, if you were to ask that question, what, what age are we in now? Um, that would, there would be a long argument. I would not advocate for saying it's the age of links, I don't think. Um, I would, it seems more likely to me that it's an age of the network, and that we are reconceiving everything just about uh, as a network, from government to marketing to our own bodies. And I'm not advocating for this. I'm just saying this is how paradigms work. And it seems to me that maybe. It's the network paradigm now that is beginning to change how we think about things, um, helped by the ecological paradigm that came before it, because those two things start to be very close. Mm -hmm. So how do you um, how do you keep the stack working? Yeah, it's a technical issue. Geniuses have figured it out. It's going to keep on going. How do you make sense of a network? You know that it, that's the discussion of information age view of knowledge versus our new view of knowledge and understanding, which is a, a, which is a, um, an important discussion. And it actually is sort of the theme of everything is miscellaneous. But um, so I'm, I'm going to not go down my miscellaneous path. So uh, in the back and then to the table. Right, but Help me. You, you asked an interesting question at the start about um, what, what enables information to, to take over the world? And you, you offered two possible answers. It's utility and it's politics. And then you, you stated that the talk was going to avoid the second of the two. But then it struck me that throughout the rest of your talk, it seemed like you were very much talking about the second if in, in somewhat other ways. For example, when you talk about information only, it only things only become information through human involvement. Um, things change depending on what revolution we're talking at and human purposes. All of these are, as you probably guess these are all components of the second question not the first so I, my question to you is is what is the distinction that you're making between those two or rather can you make a distinction right, so I was trying to absolutely right and one of the ways of looking at a lot of this um, the counter to the information age is the reinvestment of the human including and most importantly the fact that the world matters to us um, the hidden philosophy that I'm referring to, I hesitate to bring up, is, he is Heidegger's because, especially mm -hmm. since he's now been redeclared a Nazi, which of course he was, he's a Nazi prick. Uh, I'm a little hesitant to bring him up. Um, the answer to, uh, by the way, Carolina's question about what is information is for me to take a Wittgensteinian dodge and say it's actually, you know, it's a language game. It's, you know, it's a family resemblance and dodge the question entirely. Um, the power, the, what I was trying to bracket was an important and in fact, perhaps central discussion that people in this area have, which is about the sort of not the merely the uh, investment into back into this uh, of the the realm of human concerns and what matters to us and what we are trying to do, and all of which involve power and politics. I was trying to bracket out the discussion of, for example, gender and the very important um, strand that traces us back to the origins of information theory. Um, in, in the military, cybernetics and information theory. And they, you know, there's yeah. a very important Cold War history here that's rooted in in the military. So I was just trying to bracket that out so that somebody wouldn't say, "Well, you know what? You forgot the important role that you." Know. But 
I absolutely, I, yes, I think that you can view this as a power discussion all the way through. Maybe um, let's um, bundle up a few questions and then let you have a last word. Does that make sense? Uh, so, okay, yes. You, sir, Judith, and anybody else want to add a third question into the pile? I've been waiting. All right, Fernando, great. Sir. So, so it's whatever we call these ages, the ages being the overarching paradigm, what we call the next thing that happens, um, I think you did a great job of defining how do we get to where we are. Um, it seems, though, that links are only one aspect of the changes. I mean, it's a branch. It's, 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 it's no more linear thought. Now we've got branching thought. Now networks make sense. Pi calculus makes sense. There may be other things that are 10, 15 years down the road, so that 50 years down the road, whatever we Absolutely. call this age, the, the post-information age, maybe we call it in the meantime, do, do we have a better sense of that? Okay, so got a bundle. Yep. Yeah, bundle. Um, I guess you know, the one thing is that there's, there's a lot of information that's being given and a lot of manual communication. But the point of this is that I think normatively perhaps your focus ends up being more on communication technology than it is on per se. I think you know, you're looking a little bit for figuring mm. out where these connections are. And I think it's that information really is this abstraction, but it's gives, it has lots of properties that become dependent on the technology, whether it's human created technologies like the web or telephone or telegraph, or even, I mean, there's um, Mark Hauser's book on animal communication might be really interesting because he looks at simply the information carrying capacity of different evolved forms. So there's some level of communication that viruses can have, and it's a type of information that can pass between them. But so technically, there are certain limitations that humans in the age of the web don't have. So I think focusing some on the transformational properties of particular communication technologies helps both get some of the normative pieces you may be interested into and lets you not necessarily be in an argument about what the information is. Okay. Senior, last question. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, you, you mentioned uh, before a place where you say that uh, when he defines information as uh, uh, difference that makes a difference and there's like a similar take on that uh, definition which is uh, saying that information is actually a distinction that makes a distinction uh, because when you talk about distinctions actually you're talking about somebody making a distinction when when you talk about differences it seems that they're given they're in the world and so they're kind of unaffected by human agency uh, so I, I was wondering whether actually part of what you were trying to do maybe without you knowing it is um, inserting that part of like human agency into the idea of information because what Weaver does in the example that you gave there the, about the history of it, uh, information theory is basically apply something that was not designed for human beings into the general realm of human communication. Um, while it seems that what you're actually trying to do is exactly the opposite and apply human uh, agency into this very kind of cold realm of information theory and bits. Um, so I wonder whether yeah, that's uh, part of the... Three fabulous questions and I'll be done at some, some point in 2011 <laughs> answering them, so. Uh, wow, really, really hard. So um, I don't know what, uh, in 50 years, Net could be dead and could all be holographic, neurological implant, whatever, whatever, and that's the metaphor. So it's, who knows? You know, um, don't know. Uh, it does seem to me that we are out of one age. It's not clear. You know, all we can do is grow our way forward. Um, second, Judith, you and I will have to have a longer conversation because um, I, I don't think that viruses, they well may communicate. I mean, I, I accept that they communicate. I don't think that they're communicating information. I think that's a back reading of our modern sense of information, just as I would argue that, um, that uh, Babbage was not creating an information machine and that J Jacquard looms are not information based, that those, the holes in his cards are not information. An argument that I probably would lose, by the way, but that my argument <laughs> if, is that... If with Judith, yes. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, I would argue that that's a back reading into history, that information doesn't apply there. In the same way, I don't think that it applies to a virus. Um, I, I, so I could add some qualifiers to that, but I think that's where our difference is. That, um, and I desperately want to stay away from communication theory because I'll never know enough about it and they're just, you know, it's too hard. Where 
shared with your discussion separate from that model? Yes. So yes, I would love to have that discussion. Um, and Fernando, um, one of the reasons I like the Bateson quote is that I read it the way that you're reading distinction. That it's the difference that makes a difference. Well, to whom? You, you don't. You know, it's got. It already has the human uh, bit, so to speak, the, the human element inserted in it. And it's a very nice observation that uh, that Weaver is um, sort of moving out into the world of the information theory, and I'm as many others have have done. Right, I'm interested in the human element that's there, but um, we culturally have often denied. We act as if information is atoms, it's independent of us, it's uh, things that viruses did before we were even born, and that, um, and that I think is, um, I, I am interested in, in, in pointing out the human element baked into the distinction that makes a difference, a difference that makes a difference. So, oh, uh, thank you, thank you very much. Thank you, David. Thank you. Thank you.